Cool. Um, so my name is Rachel Johnston. Um, I just started here at the Bird Institute and Zoo New England about three weeks ago. Um, so I'm going to tell you about some research I did for my postdoc, which I had just finished up at Duke University. Um, so my research has mainly been focused on looking at the causes and consequences of phenotypic variation in non-model species. And a lot of my postdoctoral work was looking at how the social environment can kind of be um, read into animals um, and how that can impact animal health and gene regulation and, and phenotypic plasticity. And so today I'm going to tell you what I think is a, a pretty fun project, um, which was looking at Demarlin mole rats, which are shown uh, in the left here. So um, I mentioned that I have, you know, worked with social species. Um, and I think, you know, one of the most extreme examples of sociality is in um, social insects, right? And so this here is just a schematic of Fidoli ants. So they're um, highly specialized, they're eusocial, and it's, it really uh, exemplifies phenotypic plasticity within a social species. So given the exact same genome, um, a female can become a queen where she becomes uh, over twice the, the size of uh, non-breeding helpers or workers. Um, and so she, her job is to basically invest all her energy into reproduction, right? And then you have the non-breeding workers who, um, you know, that's a phenotypically plastic trait, but once they go uh, into that trajectory, then they cannot breed, but they invest their energy um, into foraging and taking care of young, right? And what's kind of interesting in these, uh, in this species is that the queen can actually live orders of magnitude longer than the uh, non-breeding workers. And so their use sociality is so extreme that um, you know, they've kind of escaped the costs of reproduction, right? Um, but insects aren't the only species that have evolved use sociality. Um, in mammals, there have actually been two uh, species that have been kind of uh, termed eusocial following E.O. Wilson's three criteria for use sociality. So those two species are the naked mole rat uh, on the left and then the Demarlin mole rats on the right, which is what I'm focusing on. So these animals uh, live in colonies. Um, where they show reproductive division of labor. So in these colonies of up to like 40 animals, only one female will get to reproduce. And then all the other females living in that colony will actually suppress the reproductive access such that they'll live out their entire lives, never reproducing, only helping uh, care for the young and, and doing other things within the colony. They also have overlapping generations living together and the colony members cooperate in caring for the young. Um, and something cool that uh, Justin Orion had found in 2000 when he was looking specifically at the naked mole rats is that there seems to be morphological differentiation between queens and non-breeders. So basically he just measured the length of the lumbar vertebrae, which I'll denote as LV5, which is pointed here. And he just took x-rays of a wild colony, all individuals in a colony. And he saw that controlling for body size which is just basically like measuring the head width of an animal or the zygomatic arch, controlling for that body size. Um, queens showed substantially longer lumbar vertebrae five. Um, and it wasn't clear, you know, what might have caused this. Um, there's a clear difference here. Um, but it wasn't clear whether the queens maybe were just older. And so that's why they, you know, maybe they're just older and they've like grown more. And so one of our collaborators was interested in following up on this. And so uh, Jack Thorley, um, did a, an experimental design where he took adult full sisters. Here he was looking at Demarlin mole rats, but the social systems are quite similar. Um, so he took siblings, uh, these are age matched littermates from a captive colony. So they're all known to be of the same age because they know that they were born from the same litter. And then he randomly assigned uh, the sisters to either be a queen, uh, stay as a non breeding helper, or uh, uh, basically become a solitary animal. Um, and so kind of different from the eusocial insects, these animals can actually, throughout their entire adulthood, any female has the potential to still become a queen. And the way you can do this experimentally is basically you take a, a, a non-breeding helper, you take her away from kind of the colony she was helping, her natal colony, and you pair her with an unrelated adult male and put them kind of in their own like separate tunnel system. 
that female will very quickly activate her reproductive access, which has been suppressed like her entire life, right? She'll start breeding with the male and they'll develop their own colony and she'll be the happy queen of her own colony. So he did that. Um, again, just flipping a coin to randomly assign these, these treatments. Um, for the non-breeding helper, that's basically just leaving the female within her natal colony so she continues to live as, as a helper. Um, and then he also took an individual and um, just moved her to a, her own kind of tunnel system, living alone, to see if that was sufficient, like just removing her from her own queen, is that enough to actually induce anything? And then he basically x-rayed the individuals over the course of a year to see if, if it was, you know, what, what is uh, required to actually uh, create this kind of uh, bone lengthening. And what he saw was that it's only in that queen treatment where you pair a female with a breeder do you see this accelerated lengthening of the bone. So this is really cool phenotypic plasticity where basically, you know, a mole rat has sex and then her bones just start lengthening again. And this is really cool because it's resurgent bone growth. So she was already a full grown adult female, but by being paired with a male, she started to lengthen her lumbar vertebrae. Right, so we're really kind of excited about seeing this and we we're interested in answering some, some follow-up questions. Like clearly, you know, there's something that's happening at the gene regulatory level because it's not the genome sequence that's changing, right? So we wanted to know what are the gene regulatory changes that can support the skeletal remodeling? How have mole rats figured out how to kind of induce bone growth when they've already achieved full size? We're also curious to know if it's only the lumbar vertebrae five or there are other bones that are also changing. And then finally, we wanted to know, do you know, these changes reflect any consequences of breeding or have queens escaped consequences of breeding like we've seen in eusocial insects? Um, so this is what the mole rats look like in the wild. They're subterranean, so you never see them, and it's really hard to study them in the wild. And so we um, utilize the same captive system that Jack Thorley had done in his experiment I just mentioned, where we went to, um, he basically has a field site in the Kalahari Desert in South Africa, shown here. And basically, Tim Glut, uh, this is uh, run by Tim Kluttenbrock. He's had this facility for a few years now where he brought animals into captivity. He has about 500 mole rats in captivity now. Um, and there are these really cool um, tunnel systems. And so you can actually, because there's windows in the tunnels, you can monitor the behavior and stuff. So they're doing a lot of behavioral studies on these animals. Um, and so we used this captive system where we kind of followed the exact same uh, experimental paradigm that Jack had established where he's, where we randomly assign uh, litter mates, so we know their age matched sisters, um, to either be paired with a male, so she would eventually become a breeding queen and start her own colony, or we randomly assign them to kind of remain as helpers by just live, continuing to help within their natal colony. And we then measured, you know, took x-rays um, for the course of one and a half to two years, and what we saw was that we didn't see, did in fact see that accelerated lumbar, uh, lumbar vertebrae five uh, vertebral growth. So that's shown in purple here, where you see within just the first four months, this kind of rapid um, bone growth. Um, and then it kind of tails off. So that, that extreme um, kind of uh, accelerated growth happens very, very early once they become a queen. Um, so this is just showing, we basically wanted to look at other, uh, other bones. So we then measured the length of all the lumbar vertebrae. Um, and we also uh, measured the femur and tibia just to see if, you know, they're just growing in general, or is it specific to, um, the, the spine lengthening. And so what I'm going to just show you is basically the breeder minus non-breeder length for each of those different seven lumbar vertebrae. So anything above zero means that the breeder's bone was longer. So at the start of the experiment, which is zero months, we don't see any significant difference between um, breeders and non-breeders. So nothing, you know, everything's kind of around zero. Um, and then after 12 months, we do see kind of across the lumbar vertebrae, particularly five and six, but it seems to be a little bit, uh, you know, going towards that trend across all of the lumbar vertebrae, this kind of overall lengthening of the, of the lumbar vertebrae. And this really appears to be adaptive. So when we look across all the breeding females and, um, that they have in captivity, the longer the female is, the, the longer the queen is, the larger her litter size, the more pups she's able to produce and controlling for litter size, her pups are also larger. And this makes total sense. So if we look at where the lumbar vertebrae are, 
they're directly in line with where the developing pups are. So this, you can actually see the developing skeletons here. So you can imagine, you know, lengthening your spine when you become a queen is really important um, for having a larger abdomen. They can't get fatter because they live in tunnels, so they can only get longer. But. All right, so then the next question, oh, and I should mention, we didn't see any uh, lengthening in the, the leg bones. So it does seem to be very specific to, to, the, um, to the vertebrae. So then the next question was, what are the gene regulatory changes as, associated with skeletal remodeling? Um, so at the scale we wanted, we wanted to actually look at stem cells uh, from, from those bones. Um, but really to do that, we needed a cell lab. Um, and so we decided to build a cell culture lab in the middle of the desert um, in Africa. So this is just a picture of like what the neighborhood looks like here. Um, this is that captive facility. And so we basically built a cell lab um, basically right against this building here. Um, and we were able to, that allowed us uh, the capability to look at the scale we wanted to look at, which was at the cellular level, what's happening in those, um, those stem cells. And specifically, we wanted, to, we basically had two hypotheses. Um, the first is that the lumbar vertebrae gene expression will differ between queens and non-breeders. So we were really saying what, what's being turned on to actually help regulate this growth. Um, and then we hypothesized that we shouldn't see any uh, changes in the long bone. So we actually use that as a control because we're really interested in that lengthening phenotype. So we wanted to collect the vertebrae and the long bones as a control. Um, and basically the design was we collected five of those seven lumbar vertebrae from each animal. Um, this is after one to two years that they've been through this experimental treatment of being a queen or a non-breeder, right? And so after a year of that, um, then we collected uh, bones, isolated cells, grew out those cells for five to 10 days, and then collected the samples for uh, RNA-seq um, to look at you know, all the gene regulatory changes that are happening. And then we also did a tax seq to measure the kind of 3D conformational changes across the genome as well. Um, and just a side note, we also saved two vertebrae um, in ethanol and uh, the right leg um, in ethanol so that we could do like immunohistochemistry and sectioning of the bones as well. Right, so I mentioned that we're looking at cells. Specifically, there's two cell lineages that we're looking at when we're, we're kind of extracting bone marrow. The first is mesenchymal stem cells, which can differentiate into osteoblasts and they're responsible for bone formation. And then hematopoietic stem cells, which differentiate into what are called osteoclasts and they're involved in bone resorption. And within all bones, so including your bones right now, there's this very carefully controlled kind of balance between bone formation and bone resorption between these two different types of cells. And these are the cells that we wanted to look at. And when we looked at gene expression, so we basically just measured all of the genes uh, differentially expressed within these bone cells. And we were surprised to see, uh, we found around 200 genes that were differentially expressed in queens. Um, but when we looked at the genes being upregulated in queens, we were surprised to see positive regulation of bone resorption when we did gene ontology analysis, right? So, you know, do we see processes? We didn't want to just look gene by gene, but actually what are the sort of processes that are changing together? And this was our by far most significant hit. And so when I say like we saw enrichment of this process, it, we saw 91 times more genes than we would expect involved in bone resorption. Now, if you remember, this was, so this was unexpected. We were actually focused on the phenotype was bone formation is what we were expecting, right? We were interested in a, a bone growth phenotype. And here we're seeing this signal of bone resorption. And that was puzzling and we could have just tried to ignore it or, you know, uh, but we're, we really wanted to see like, what is, what is this gene expression telling us? Um, is there something more to this than what we might've thought we were, were looking at? Um, so as I mentioned before, um, oh, I'll just point out that, um, you know, when we looked at the major regulators that actually push cells into these differentiation pathways towards bone formation or bone resorption, all of the genes we we're seeing upregulated are really pushing towards that bone resorption pathway. So it's a very strong signal, so strong that we figured we might, you know, we should really try to understand this better. So as I mentioned before, we had collected um, some of the bones into ethanol. Um, so this is, a, this is a nice thing that we happen to have done um, where we, you know, from the same animal, we had saved some for RNA-seq, but we also just saved some of the bones um, in ethanol. And so we actually went back to those bones and we said, well, do we see any evidence of bone resorption or bone thinning? 
So we did micro CT scans of the bones. This is a, a, an image of, of the femur. So we looked at the femurs, the midsection. So we just basically cut it in half and look at the amount of bone area. And so what I'm gonna show you are lines connecting, remember I said they're paired female sisters that were randomly assigned to one or another. I'm gonna show you lines um, kind of connecting what those two sisters look like in terms of the total amount controlling for the overall area. So how much bone did they have? When we looked at the femur midsection, we were surprised to see that the queens were definitely showing thinner bones, um, which is not something that we had, had went in expecting. And this is in the femur. Um, so then we actually used an automated method um, where we basically, there's a cool um, you know, software where it can kind of go through, scan the entire bone, and then map out, uh, it measures bone thickness for you at like 50,000 points along the bone. Um, and then it maps out kind of a color map on that bone. So that's shown here. Um, so this is a, a sister pair where one was randomly assigned to be a queen, one was a non-breeder. This queen over the course of a year only happened to have one offspring. They can have like five offspring every four months. So she could have had a lot. She only had one. And when we look at bone thickness, which is here's a scale. So red means thin bone. We don't really see any bone thinning in this um, breeding female relative to the non-breeding control. And even when queens only had two or three offspring, the, the femurs actually look, in terms of thickness, looks pretty similar to the non-breeding individuals. But when we started looking at females who were very reproductively active, so they had you know, six, nine, 12 offspring in the course of the year, we, I don't know if you guys can see the color or maybe the absence of blue is, is what you can uh, see best here, but basically everything starts becoming red. Their bones are showing significant thinning as they've invested more in reproduction. Um, this was exciting, something not expected, but you know, just by kind of really delving into RNA-seq, this was, with, this was another phenotype we were able to discover that we you know, weren't looking for originally. Um, and this is just showing that if we kind of quantify it, you know, across the entire femur, we see the significant reduction in, in bone thickness, um, and it changes linearly with the number of offspring. So for every additional offspring a female has, we see thinner bones. And then the final question we wanted to ask then is, does this actually have uh, any consequence to the animal? Like, does this, you know, we're seeing a phenotype, but then we kind of want to go to the next level. Like, does this matter to the animal? And so, there's a method, it's basically like mechanical loading where they will actually, you can put a bone on these little pins and then you put force in the middle of the bone and it can, it measures the force that it takes until the bone breaks. And you can basically build like a survival curve. Um, so you guys might be familiar with seeing survival curves for like a living animal, when does it die? They can build kind of a similar idea where you build survival curves for a bone where instead of like lifetime, it's actually, relative force, so how much force do you put? And what is the probability that that bone survives that force before it breaks, which would be like equivalent to death for the bone. Um, so we mapped this out. We, because we had put the bones in ethanol, you can't actually like can't do the, the mechanical tests on the bones we had, but there's um, lots of data on mouse data. And we were able to use um, that kind of 3D micro CT scans that we use to and basically use modeling from mouse data, scaled our data, and we can predict what the strength of that bone is. And so when we did that, we saw that indeed, we see a decrease in the survival probability of queen femurs, um, meaning that for the same amount of force, a queen uh, bone is more, a uh, femur is more likely to break. So this does seem relevant. Um, and if we map out those queens that had a lot of offspring, like six or more offspring, um, I don't, are you guys able to see that right even that's, I should, I'll choose next, a better color for next time, but basically um, this dark red line shown here is showing that if for queens that have had a lot of offspring, um, they're showing si significant uh, reduction in bone strength, such that for every additional uh, pup that a queen, um, you know, has, she has a 21% increase in likelihood of bone fracture. Um, so there does seem to be a strong effect in terms of bone strength. Um, so just trying to kind of like pull this all together, what are, what are we seeing? Well, you know, we saw that there's this rapid elongation of the bones in the, the lumbar vertebrae, and that happens like within the first few months. Um, but then we also see the significant bone thinning at the time that we at least sample 
um, you know, the cells. And so I just kind of want to emphasize when thinking about, you know, your own projects and, and your experimental design, that the time of, of sample of sampling for RNA-seq is very important. So, you know, it ends up that we think that because we didn't collect the, the um, lumbar vertebrae until like 12 months into treatment, we missed that lengthening phenotype at the gene regulatory level because that happened the first four months. So we were like eight months late in terms of sampling. Um, but we did see that, you know, there is this ongoing evidence of bone thinning. And why might that be? Well, this is the only female that is responsible for reproducing for to build an entire colony. She's the only one reproducing and she's the only one lactating, which means all of the, you know, all of that energy that's required for calcium and, uh, you know, for nutrients has to come from this female. And so it's probably sucking a lot of the, the bone from her own bones to provide um, for these offspring that are de developing inside of her. And then also the basically the previous litter that's also lactating. Um, so it's, you know, it seems to be incredibly difficult for um, for a breeder to 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 be a breeder to be a breeder. Um, so just to summarize, we see extensive morphological and gene regulatory changes in queens. Um, you know, sometimes RNA-seq data can give you surprising results, but I just kind of really encourage you to really think about when did I sample it? You know, when did I take the sample? Which cells am I looking at? Because that's so critical also. You might actually get a, you know, a sample that's just a little bit off in terms of the phenotype you're looking at. So just pairing like what, what cells um, you know, you're sampling and the time of sampling is very important for what you're gonna pick up in the signal. Um, we saw acceleration of lumbar vertebral growth, which appears to be adaptive, but we also saw this unexpected bone thinning, which appears to be costly and long lasting. And so just to kind of wrap up, um, you know, in thinking about use sociality in insects, you know, the Damarlin mole rats are also showing morphological changes and regulatory re rewiring, but um, you know, they, it seems like the queens haven't really reach the point of use sociality where you know the queens have escaped reproductive costs because we are seeing reproductive re reproductive costs in these animals and with that i just want to say um you know i've worked with a lot of people on this project Je jenny tung was my advisor and was huge in kind of leading um you know and advising me on this work and i'm happy to take questions